Hello and welcome to Talking Wealth. I'm Doug Gillum, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within. And today we've got a fantastic topic. We're going to be talking about the top 10 stocks for April 2023. But before we get into that, I want to introduce my co-host, Janine Cox. How are you today? Fantastic. Thank you. And so excited about this topic because, because you know I love talking about the, the top 20 shares. <laughs> you do. And I know we, we, I mean, obviously on our podcast, we haven't talked about stocks for a while, have we? No. And you're only going to let me talk about the top 10. Is that right? Or the top 20? Well, absolutely. Because I didn't oh. want to make this podcast three hours long. So we're only going to look at the top 10. But what we need to talk to about people about is we're going to be bringing up spreadsheets mm-hmm. and we're going to be bringing up charts of these stocks. Exciting. We're going to be doing that similar to how we do with our live show for TalkingWealth.com and obviously my market report. But for those people listening to this as an audio podcast, mm. they can see the video that we're recording right now of this on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, just type in Wealth Within TV, it'll come up on YouTube and you'll be able to see. Yeah, so this. they might want to listen to it twice. I mean, it's it's worth doing when you're talking about this sort of information. Well, a lot of people... Bo- binge listening to our podcast. I only spoke to somebody earlier today and they're saying, oh, I love, I go for a walk every morning and listen to your podcast, you know, and then I had somebody yesterday was, you know, message saying, I love the new casual style that you guys have with these podcasts, which is the video style and obviously mm. the audio style. Because, I mean, up this time last year, we'd never done a podcast together, yeah. you know, not an audio podcast. So if you if you are listening to this on your podcast, uh, this on your podcasting app like iTunes, just head over to Wealth Within TV on YouTube and you'll be able to watch it because it'll help you understand some of the content because when we get onto charts, you may, you're you not going to be seeing what we're talking about so it'll make more sense but there's still a lot of information that we're going to give you today. So, um, But what I want to do is just introduce a little bit about what we're talking about here. The market's a bit volatile. We're mm. April 2023. We're seeing CPI still high. We're seeing in Australia possibly... 11th. In well, they're talking about the fact that inflation is actually kicking back now, coming down. Well, that's down. what they've been hoping. I haven't seen the latest figures. Have mm. you seen them? Well, I didn't see the data, but I read somewhere quickly, I think it was last night, that they're starting to see the numbers come down. Well, that's what we're hoping. But the, you know, obviously, there's talk of an 11th consecutive mm. rate rise. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think we've probably got one or two rate rises left. We're seeing a lot of issues around the US banking system, obviously, mm. with the collapse of the um, Silicon Valley Bank. And yep. obviously some of the other things we've talked about on our in, in Talking Wealth, on our recordings for that. So it's quite interesting that we should be talking about, I think it's quite timely that we're talking about these top 10 shares because they pretty much drive our market. Look, I mean, when you think about it first before we talk about that, mm. what, you, what you were just saying before, since when do mm. these um, chiefs of the Federal Reserve and the RBA ever get it right? They always Is overshoot that a or undershoot. So therefore, based on history, if we're thinking about that, chances are they've overshot the mark now, which is what the banks have been saying. They've been expecting it to cut the rates to come back mm-hmm. a little bit. But I don't think the rates will come back too much if they even if they do, but I think that they're more likely to just stop and wait now because they're starting to see the numbers turn the other way. Well, I think they should because obviously with interest rate rises, it's a slow change. Mm. It takes or they take a while to bite. Now they're starting to bite. Mm. But, you know, I saw the other day, you know, um, retail spending is starting to slow. But, you know, they've been rising interest rates for 10 straight months. Yes. So now they're starting to slow. But interesting, I had, did an interview this morning with a new expert for Talking Wealth. He's a gold or precious metal expert from the US with 40 years experience in precious metals. And I was asking him about, you know, currencies and I was asking him about gold as a hedge against, um, Mm -hmm. you know, what's been going on at the moment. Obviously, if the market does pull back or the economy goes into a recessionary environment, is gold a better investment? And Mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Um, But to me, watch the video. But one thing is interesting Really interesting that he said, he said, with these fiat currencies, which is what we have, mm-hmm. I know you and I have talked about modern money theory on TalkingWealth.com and some recordings, and some people may not have heard about modern money theory, but basically everybody knows that governments continue to print money, especially mm-hmm. the US, but Australia does it as well. Our debt's going through the roof here in Australia. It's gone mm-hmm. through the roof in the US. And it's really interesting to, to see that he says the rate of return the more com- com- countries borrow, the less um, growth we get. Mm. 
And he said, that's what's been going on. You know, they're thinking, oh, we just borrow more, print more money and go and spend it on infrastructure and everything else and get the economy going. But what happens is the growth is getting a lot less. Yep. So that's why we're seeing the issues we're seeing today. And I think, again, that's what I think, you know, us covering the top 10 stocks because basically materials and banking drive the all But see, I don't see that there's an issue with that growth getting less as long as the money's not going offshore. I do think it's huge No, issue. I'm just saying that if, if they've put all this money into the economy, it has mm. to go somewhere. And eventually it goes offshore. Right, eventually it goes into the land price, mm-hmm. right? So property prices, stock prices. Yep. But it doesn't always have to go offshore, but it does if it's going to the companies that are, you know, have their hooks in Australia that well, we are taking that We don't manufacture anything in Australia and there's a lot of issues around that and I know, you know, the Liber- Labor Party has talked about getting more manufacturing in Australia and we've been crying out for that for years because mm. we we decimated our car industry and many other industries mm. and Australian companies going offshore and or being eaten up by offshore companies. So we've seen that a lot. I mean, our, we used to produce a lot of, you know, shoes and clothing here in Australia. We don't do that anymore. Mm. You know, a mate of mine, he's a sewing machine mechanic and he's almost as rare as hen's teeth, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you know, he's only going to work for maybe five or ten more years max and he doesn't know anybody else. That's we, could, we could get into a whole huge. discussion about this as mm. a separate podcast. We could. It's, it's, it's an interesting topic but, mm. I, you know, to me is, you know, why we want to cover these top ten stocks is because they are the ones that drive the market. Mm. With materials and banking making up almost half of our all ordinaries index, which well, think is f- about superannuation investing yeah. in the biggest stocks. Yes. So there's so much money that will always continue to go into these. So shoes. in terms of the top twenty stocks, how many of them are financials? Well, I think there's about there's big ones, the the big four. I think there's about ten, isn't there? And we've maybe got, eleven. And we've got Macquarie. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge We're going to talk about Macquarie today. We're going to talk about some of the banks today. We're going to talk about BHP today. We're going to talk about Rio today. We're going to talk about Fortescue today because they're Mm. in the top 10. So I want to get into that now. I'm going to – just to preempt what I'm talking about here is I've done a spreadsheet, which Mm -hmm. I've looked at all the data on the history that we have in our charts. Yes. And looked at the yearly returns on all of the top 10 stocks. We've done it for a lot more than the top 10, but I just wanted to stick to the top 10 today and look at – the reality of it, because often people don't look at the bigger picture. They look at what's happening today or what happened mm. in the last couple of months, but they don't look at what the viability of a company is and the growth of the company, the volatility of the company, and, and their the how do I say it? The risk any company may present to their portfolio. And, and I think some of the figures in that we're going to show history. today, yeah, in terms of yeah. history, but I think people are going to be shocked at yeah, some. Yeah, people of just look at the name and they think, oh, okay. Mm. That's a bank. It's got to be good to invest in, and I'm mm. likely to get good returns over time. But yeah. it's like we say to anybody: it depends on the actual time frame that you were investing. Correct. Because stocks go through cycles, so it could be mm. that even we've seen in the last decade, stocks like ANZ, mm. Westpac, NAB, if all they've achieved is a sideways move, then what sort of stock is that? Well, that's that's, that's what I was getting at. And as we show mm. the spreadsheet, you'll say, would you prefer to invest in a stock? that has 50% of the time it goes up and 50% of the time it goes down, or would you rather well, to us it doesn't 70% matter. of the time going up? Well, to us it doesn't matter. No, I'm really just matter. talking about in general. Mm. I'm not if you're in a long-term Regardless investor, about whether you're knowledgeable. You want one that's going up most of the time. Yeah, you don't want one but that's going in, down. But the stock market theory is such that they're they're going to change hats. They so do. therefore the stock that was doing beautifully, like say CSL has done over years, mm. will then change eventually. And we're going to talk about CSL. Mm. So how about we bring up the 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 spreadsheet first and I want to explain what I've done on the spreadsheet here. So mm-hmm. on the spreadsheet that you've got on your screen right now, you'll see that we've got the top 10 stocks. So we've got from BHP and this is in order of market capitalization. So BHP is the largest company in Australia, then yep. CBA, CSL, NAB, Westpac, ANZ, Macquarie, Fortescue, mm. Woodside and Wes Farmer. So that's in order. So, okay. from our so you haven't got market cap there. but No, I haven't put the market cap, but I've ordered them in mm. terms of market cap. I, don't, oh, I want to try idea. to keep a lot of the data off, if that makes sense, so there's not bucket yeah. loads of data for people to look through. It's interesting, isn't it, mm. that ANZ still is the is lagging behind the other banks? It is. It is quite interesting. And then for our podcast listeners at audio, I mean, obviously – Telling them that the order of the mm. top 10 helps them rather because, but if you do want to watch it, go to YouTube. Looking at this now, BHP number one, okay, so largest stock in the Australian market mm-hmm. at this particular time. Yes. The data we got back on BHP is 42 years. So that goes right back to the early 80s that we've got. And most of them we've got 39 years. So BHP we've got 42, CBA 32 because it only floated in the 90s. 
um, yep. CSLs 29, NAB 39, Westpac 39, ANZ 39, because they've been around for a long time. Macquarie, a little bit newer, 27. Fortescue, only 21 years and Woodside 39 and West. So, so, so that's a lot of data that we've got. So when you look at this, you could think, you know, one of two mm. ways, just big picture going going over this like a helicopter, you can mm. see two stocks stand out above others. But yeah. when in general, most of them are 60 or 70%, you know, around that sort of mm. level, you've got Woodside, which is 59, and you've got NAB, which is 59. They're the ones sort of at the bottom and then maybe Westpac and ANZ 64, you could sort of group those in together. Mm. And then there's another group in the middle, which is West Farmers FMG 67. You've got um, 66, the CBA and BHP 67, mm. and the two outstanding ones, CSL and Macquarie. So, you know, you could look at it that way and say, well, if you had invested in most of those except for maybe um, – the two that were a bit slower, Woods, uh, Woodside and NAB, in theory, you should do really well. You should because the average, what what we're, what Janine's talking about is we've gone through every single year and looked at the growth or positive or negative yeah. growth on that. So so what, what, what she's talking about, say, from example of BHP, which will bring up a stock with their stock chart shortly, over the 42 years of data that we have, now this goes through the end of 2022, so the 31st of December 2022, 42 years, 28 of those years BHP returned a positive. It wasn't in negative at all, it was in positive. There's, there's a bit of an negative. issue with the data though, right, the way that mm. I see it, and that is that mm. if you drew the line in the sand and you said that the last 10 years, we look at all of those, and these stocks and well. how they performed over the last 10 years. Yep, that. that's right. That's really, to me, more important mm. because the start of the data for many charts could be really, um, I guess, underweight in terms of really Correct. making an impact mm. on the, the overall data. Plus, if you've got, you know, 16 years on one stock and only six years on another, what sort of a comparison is that? It's yeah, and that's really- why I wanted to do the last 10 years as well because it it's – we're going to give heavier mm. weighting to what's happened in the last 10 years. Because and our students will really history. understand that from a pattern point of view. They will. So looking at the big picture pattern of any stock and the way that it unfolds, if you think, oh, well, I've only included the last six years of CSL, but I've got 16 years of Woodside, it's not really telling me because you know that Woodside's had more of the pattern to unfold than mm. what CSL has had. And so therefore I don't see the full picture of all that data that could eventually... Yeah. yeah. Now with the with the big four banks, which are all in the top ten mm. uh, on Monday's last Monday's recording, um, which my, I think it's my last market report for March. I actually just did the big four banks, and mm. also I went back not just the last and that's a really good line. comparison. It is yeah. a good comparison. So we did all time the last ten years, but I actually went back to what it was prior to two thousand and fifteen, because all the big four banks fell from two thousand and fifteen to two thousand and twenty. Mm. And I looked at their falls and what their returns was prior to that because I think they'll return back to what they were prior to 2015. But let's mm. have a look at BHP. So it had 42 years, 28 yep. of those are positive, 14 were negative. So therefore 67% of the time BHP rises in its whole history that we have data for. Now BHP has been around a lot longer than 42 years, but mm. ASX data we don't have mm. Solid data. And what I mean by solid data is prior to sort of 81, 82, the data is a lot more patchy mm-hmm. that we can get on stock. So, and I'm sure it's available somewhere, but we've never found it much. Yeah. Um, but that's not a bad but return, a, is it? 60% or 7% of the time. It's a decent amount of time to get an appreciation, isn't it? Mm. So let's now go and look at BHP. Actually, do you want to go and look at the last 10 years first on BHP first? Okay. Just to show, and then yep. we can talk about it on the chart as well. So how many? Years, so you've got the last ten years here, and you're looking at six positive and four negative. So yeah, so it's dropped from sixty-seven percent to sixty percent. So the last ten years, all of them have dropped. So in all time, the average was sixty-seven percent mm. positive years. That's what they did from one January to thirty-first of December yep. in the years. The last ten years, that's now average has dropped to sixty-four percent. So BHP is down to sixty. Mm-hmm. CBA is down to sixty percent. CSL is 90%. So yep. 90% of the last 10 years CSL has gone up. Now, so that really, really emphasises that pattern mm. thing, doesn't it? Because it's the scenario of the pattern being advanced, if you like, or behind where, say, the banks are and BHP are. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So what are the rest? So we got NAB's next. What's that one? So NAB and Westpac both 50%. Yep. And ANZ's in there as well. Same level. It's interesting that those three banks are the ones that had that big sideways pattern and they've produced that because yep. we'd expect that to be the case. But And you raised the issue before. Mm. You said, well, would you like to trade a stock that's up 50% of the time and down 50% of the time? Which is really an interesting conundrum because for a trader, that's fantastic. Um, it is because both all of those stocks have had good runs in the last 10 years. Yeah. And bad runs in the mm. last 10 years. So flip Because it. how many times have we looked at a stock that has long runs? Like let's take CSL, for example. And how many times have we looked mm. at, say, CSL and we thought it was going to peak out? Yes, and it kept going. And it just kept going. So we had to try to second guess, whereas – if stocks are crossing trend lines and they're giving these rises 50% up, you know, the time 50% of the time they're down, it might actually be easier to trade something mm. like that, which goes with a bank, doesn't it? Like Correct. a bank in theory should mm. be easy for an investor to manage. It should be easy. And then we, you know, people were in love with banks prior mm. to 2015. Like it doesn't matter whether I was talking to people in the early 90s. Everybody had banks in their portfolio. Everybody mm. bought and held banks. Every broker was putting banks in portfolios. Every financial planner was putting banks in people's portfolios. Mm. Buy and hold, forget about it. Go into a coma, come back <laughs> 20 years, you'll make a lot of money. And you can still do that, but the banks are not that same investment that they were back 10 or 20 or 30 years ago where they but were the that kind of thing. the interesting thing about that, if you look right back to the start of the data or earlier mm. in the data, there were big dips that happened. Mm. It's just that... Either the communication that's available mm. or the history is not there. You know, the, the history is on the internet in terms of being able yep. to find it. But say 20 years ago, the availability of that information wasn't there. It wasn't correct. Right. So in terms of where we are now, people, investors are so much better off really, or are they? Uh, I don't know. Well, the question is then, are stocks trading on their fundamental value or are they just more trading on emotional values mm. that people's, I think banks are going to do this or I think Fortescue, classic example of one that runs on people's emotions. It just goes well, we, flying we, up we and flying down We did that presentation again. on Tuesday night and Kramer mm. from CNBC oh, yeah, yeah. put up that um, bit about we've just got a lot of cohorts of know-nothings. Mm. You know, the, the market's just totally irrational right now. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because we talk about the market and whether it's um, irrational, yep. you know, whether it's factoring in everything that's available. But mm. it's it's almost like there's a big disconnect between what um, investors or what the market, the big players are doing, and and what the numbers yeah. are, are indicating could be do, the the data could be showing. Well, we talked about the show before the mm. live show before we, we talked about P ratios talked about, you know, what is a good PE ratio and what should you be doing with investing. Mm -hmm. So that was also on TalkingWealth.com on that show. If you it's almost that. like, you know how we said in it, we said in, on the show it's mm. about a play group, playbook. It's mm. almost like they've got no idea, so let's just stick to the playgroup book because this is a time of high inflation, therefore this is what we should be doing, bang. And you can't do that anymore. <laughs> I don't think so. So so yeah. we had Westpac, ANZ, NAB, 50% win-loss ratio mm. or not profit loss mm -hmm. um, over the last 10 years. Macquarie, have a look at that one. Wow. Yeah, Macquarie's amazing, isn't it? 90%. But it's interesting that the percentages stayed the same with the two. So it shows that the form of the chart must be fairly similar in terms of trends. Correct. Over time or the amount Big of growth time. stocks, so you're so up 90% yep. of the time. Macquarie but finishing But West Farmers has actually come up. Um, to 80%. Yeah, West Farmers at 80%, um, Woodside 50% and Fortescue, look at that one, 60% mm. Fortescue 60%, which, you know, mm. we'd expect that from some of the miners and because they're so volatile. Correct. Mm. So what I want to do now is go into each one of the charts of those stocks. So, so what we can also go into all of the data for BHP. Mm -hmm. So if you want to bring up the BHP chart, the data okay just where we got all this data from. Yep. So if we're looking at that screen now, you can see the open, the high, the low, the close, the gain or loss in the yeah, in dollar terms and in percentage terms. And if you just push it over to the left a little bit, you'll see the, the years. Um, okay. It's, it, it's moving, missing column A. Um, now the column A you can see there. So, so we've got data back to January 1981. Mm. So you can see on the column G on the very right-hand side, that's if it's red, that means that was a loss year. Yep. So I've included a zero gain as a positive because it was a negative because yep, um, I needed wise. to include it mm -hmm. somewhere. But we can see, looking at this and scrolling down, you can see when there's more reds and more whites and looking at the different years because obviously we can see 
2008, negative, yeah. But then 2009, BHP was up 41%. Mm. So we can look at what was the biggest gain? What was – how volatile is that stock? What's the biggest look gain? At, look What's at its these, biggest look loss? Look at this start. Like, now, because in mm. our mind, we – we in our analysis, not mm. just in our mind, but it's on paper, on a chart, showing us the history indicating that we should be going into one of the biggest booms right now. Correct. We've just come through COVID, mm. though, yep. and – you know, that's in a time where people who are in the know can really take advantage of economies and countries around the world who maybe got, and even Australia, who have been impacted mm. financially significantly by COVID and then could come in and just swoop and pick up things, you know, pick up assets, mm. maybe big um, companies who are really looking at that, can I say vultures? Correct, absolutely. Um and then if we're looking at um, the data again, mm. we can see here, if we're going mm. back, that 2007 yeah. was actually 58% um, gain for BHP. If we go back and we see, if we relate this to what assets are doing, we're thinking, okay, yeah. when was the next big one? We've got, we've got 40% in 2009. 2009. 2005 was 50%. There's some huge returns yeah. here. Yeah. So therefore, in this time, investors need to be not fearful but very attentive to what's going on because mm. um, moves like that will repeat in this part of the cycle. What I wanted to do, but I didn't get a time to do it before this podcast, is I wanted to take that data, and I need to learn some stuff on Excel mm. too, is how to take that data and go, okay, so a gain of 0 to 10%, is it 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 40, or, and, and losses in, mm. in and make a, a bar chart, not a bar chart, a column chart showing how many times BHP's hit 50% or yeah. above, how many times has it hit 10% and above, how many times has it lost mm. 10%. And, and just to show people, because I can guarantee there's probably going to be a sweet spot in the middle where mm. you go, okay, well, if BHP is 67% positive years, what's that positive? Is it more likely to be 5 to 10% or is it more mm. likely to be 10 to 20%? Yep. To looking at that and understanding some of that helps you determine. Because I guess if a stock is if a stock is produced um, mm -hmm. between seventy and eighty percent of the time, it's having a positive year. Yeah. I mean that, that's huge numbers to give Correct. investors confidence about what it's doing. Bingo. But it doesn't mean that you should just. It's like an, any analysis. It doesn't mean that you should just automatically assume that next year it's going to do the same That's thing. True. So if people want us so. to do those figures, and and I'll obviously, if you want us to do the other top ten stocks, please make a comment on the YouTube channel um, and say, "Hey, I want the other ten mm. stocks." But I want them. What I'm I'm happy to do the data and do the the spreadsheets and et cetera to do that. But they need to comment mm. saying, "Yes, I want the other ten stocks." They also need to like the video and subscribe to the channel because unless we get lots of likes, I'm not going to do it. Right. Fair so enough. So that's, that's the payment they've got to do. They've got to say so yes. So tell your friends. They've tell got to tell you, you've got to share the video. Tell your family. They've got to tell your family yep. and friends. You've got to like the video mm. and subscribe to the channel and tell us that you want the other 10 stocks. That's pretty cheap, isn't mm. it, for them to get the other yeah. 10 stocks. So if you if you are watching this, um, please do that on YouTube now. And uh, it's getting it all in one sure place, get onto which is really helpful. Mm. Yeah, I mean, those listening to an audio podcast, get onto YouTube, move the comment, mm. like the video. We thank the you whole for bit. that. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's a win-win, is it? We're giving people mm. something so they can do something to get That's it right. a little bit. But let's – so we've looked at this. Now let's go and have a look at – unless you've finished with the, this. Well, why don't we just look at one more, just because I thought that was yeah. really interesting to look at some of the data. Well, I was thinking about go to the chart of BHP first okay, and see how yeah, that might great. Right. And then we can go okay. to the next one. Fantastic. Let's yep. do that. All right, so I've got ANZ up there. Let's go to BHP. So which one do you want? Do you want to stick to the monthly and look at long term? Look, I'll let you drive it. You're I think the, we should. You're the charterholic. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Last so 10 BHP. years. Um, you've got more than 10 years there, but so you can see the years, you can yeah. see the what you're talking about. Okay, so you can see that there was a big decline down here, obviously, and I'm going to take that cross here off so we don't get um, interference there, but... Overall, if we're looking at this move, say from 2000 and where are we, uh, 23, somewhere here. Yeah. So somewhere in here, 2013, we've got this big decline into 2016. And then most of the time, BHP's kept going up from there. So the last 10 years has obviously been quite interesting. But if we, it depends on where you start, put the Starting line always, yeah, always does, and the data is going to change, and that's the thing that people need to be really mindful of, and that's why having an understanding of charting and understanding the p big picture patterns is really so important for anybody, 
because of that fact. So if we if we were to put the start starting line here in two thousand and eight, we'll look spent eight years falling, really. Well, that's why I wanted Sideways to do, do that spreadsheet back mm. to inception and just share people because what we talk about when we teach traders is what happened in the past will happen again. Mm. So if stocks have gone down for years, they will do it again. If they've gone up for years, they will do it again. If they've gone sideways for years, they'll do it again. Mm-hmm. Maybe not to the same volume or the same speed, but they will. It's you know, we repeat things. History repeats. We've mm. had in that data for BHP, we've had... Um, 87 crash. Mm-hmm. We've had TFC crash. Yep. We've had COVID crash. We've had recessionary environments. We've had bear markets and we've had bull markets mm. in that data that, that we showed on that spreadsheet. And this chart shows all of that. But we should we should show mm. them the whole history because that's Absolutely. what we've put on the spreadsheet. So it's not just looking at the dates that I've just picked out there and that Dale's picked out that look interesting. It's about understanding mm the cyclical nature of the shares and how they unfold for yourself. And you can only do that once you start learning how to read the chart. So looking at this here, you can see these big rises over long term that mm. BHP's had, but then all this sideways stuff here, that was, you know, almost what, eight years or something or six years sideways yeah. and doing nothing. Same with back here. Yep. Um, to 1993 all the way through there to 1998 or 1997. It's four years sideways. So people really want to do their research and mm. BHP is a great stock to buy and, and trade, but this also gives you looking at the chart and understanding that data. Mm. You can see their period years. You should know BHP. But you can also go back because, you know, Google's a great thing nowadays. We can go back and look at what the economy was back in those periods mm. where it was sideways. What was going on with commodity prices? Mm. What was going on with the Aussie dollar? What was going on with um, a whole range of different things? What was CPI? All, yeah. And what were, what were interest rates doing? So they can get a look at what af- what affects BHP because as mm. a commodity stock or material stock, mining, we know the commodities affect the Australian dollar, whether Absolutely. they're going up and down. So there's lots of things. So then they can go, okay, so if this is happening – that's giving me signposts that this could be happening with the BHP site price over the coming years or months. Mm. And so it's helping us understand what drives BHP. Now, BHP in this time of this chart, it's split off numerous entities, you know, like One Seal, Blue Scope Steel, blah, blah, yes. blah. There's other things that it's been doing. It's also bought companies mm. um, and brought things into its its fold. So, yeah, and people say, well, look, how is all of this going to be relevant then if the company's changing over time? But, but it doesn't help you understand it, does well, it? Well, I can tell you how mm. because once I sat in a group of fundamentalists, this was yeah. years ago when I was in my 20s, and um, I was the, probably not the youngest person in the room, but um, there weren't Pretty that close. many. There was a lot of <laughs> older people there, yeah. And... So I sat next to this gentleman, he was probably in his late 70s and he said he was talking about BHP and mm. having a discussion and I said to him, I just grabbed a napkin, grabbed a pen, drew the chart of BHP pretty much as you see it on the screen there and not obviously with the current data on it because this was back in 2000 and when was this have been 2005 maybe? Mm. 2005, 2006, and I just drew it all out for him. And then I said to him, you know, this is, and I just drew some vertical lines on the chart just to show him the cyclical nature of it. And I said, see see this? I said, if you knew this, you wouldn't be owning BHP then, would you? And he looked at it and he's just, he almost went a shade of white just because of the rhythmic nature of what I was showing him. Yeah, they don't understand that, did they? Mm. Yeah, and BHP is very, very cyclical. So... Right now, obviously, we're in April 2023. BHP, we've seen the data mm. of what it's over its history. We've seen that it rises roughly See, that's 60 beautiful to 70% to, of the time. It, you, your mm. data is beautiful because when you look at the data mm. and you think, okay, 60 to 70% of the time and then in the last 10 years it goes, it changed, it changed to, what was it, 50 no, that BHP? was BHP. Well, you can bring up the spreadsheet if Just you like. Just go back to it for Just a minute. Just check it. So make sure you're being accurate because we love accuracy here. We do. And we go back to the, the summary. Okay. So it went, BHP went to 60, 60 okay, from 60, 67 or something, I think, I think it was. It was. Yep. yep. Okay. And then, so if we're looking at that and we're looking at this chart and thinking, okay, long term, we know that it's more likely to be up, but are we really going to be in it? You know, when, mm. how long are you going to live for? You know? People say you're investing for the long term. Well, what is that? 
It oh. might be, you know, 10 years. It might be f- 15 years. It might be five years for some people. Correct. So, you know, if, if you're thinking about that and your time frame in the market, it's really important to understand the nature of the stock because like ANZ mm. um, and NAB, um, Westpac, Commonwealth Bank, not so much Commonwealth Bank but the other three, yeah. if they're only 50-50 over the last 10 years. Yeah, you've got to be more active in the market you've got and to be, you've got to know what you're doing. That's right. Yeah. doesn't mean you shouldn't be buying the stocks. You just buy them mm. when they're going up. So what's BHP likely to do in this year and in the next couple of years? Well, look, I mean, I had expected that BHP mm. would um, have a bit more of a, I was hoping that it would pull back first. So more. this recent rise mm. that we saw on BHP and then the current pullback we're yep. now seeing in the short term, we'll just enlarge that so that People everybody can, can have a doing. look at that. Again, if you are listening to this on our podcast or audio podcast, go to um, YouTube Talk wealth within, wealth within TV and you'll see that video recording of all this so you can understand what we're talking about. Yeah, because most of the time things happen mm. in the bigger picture as one would expect according to the patterns. Yeah. But sometimes in the shorter to medium term, things can change slightly. There can be mm. a view that we have and yeah. there can be an alternate view, as you know, that we have about yes. how the stock's going to unfold. So ideally... BH, I was hoping yeah. BHP was going to pull back first and then take off through the all-time high. Well, that's pulled back this year so far, isn't it? We've, I mean, well, I'm talking about this pullback. You know, like oh, I, pullback, in an ideal scenario, it would have pulled back a bit more like Rio did hmm. and then took off because now it's just sitting there waiting okay. in the water. It's taken off through that high, which is a really good sign of a further rise to come. So that's the, the bigger picture analysis indicates that it could go further. But the funny thing is the data that we've just looked at talks about sideways moves and what BHP can do and how Mm. how over the if we were to just forget the volatility that's happening in here and just look at how BHP just prior to any peak, how long it actually was still trading at roughly the same price. Mm. You're talking about 2006 to 2016, that's 10 years. As we said before, it was six years, four years. Mm. So BHP has been making a sideways move for the last few years. So mm. is that going to continue for an, another year? Quite po- and, It could. And that's mm. the thing is, and that's why having that knowledge and education around how to recognise mm. what we're talking about. And this is some of the stuff we, I mean, obviously today, this is a podcast where you know, we're not teaching people what we teach our diploma students and everything here today, but we're helping people give, I think what, what I wanted to do or one of my goals for today is give people insights into how we think and how we look at some of these stocks. It's just not looking at the chart or just not looking at a P-E ratio or just not looking at an EPS or a dividend yield. It's, there's a whole lot of things that we put in behind it. And yeah, think, we're sort of looking at, mm, at the car when it's finished, not mm, looking at how the cars come together. Yeah, you know correct. I mean? That's right, so it? I want to keep moving on. I mean, obviously we spend a lot of time on BHP at the moment to sort of explain a little bit about what our thinking is and everything else. But I think we can probably move a little bit faster now okay, into the great. other nine stocks. That do you want to start people. from the spreadsheet and come back? Or Let's do you go, want go back to the straight? spreadsheet again and look at the next stock and just show people the quick figures again. Yep. So so the next one is CBA, which is after with 32 okay. years of data at 66%, it has a rise. Yep. Okay. Over the last 10 years, it's that dropped to 60%. So yeah. it's dropped a little bit in the last 10 years. Okay. So now let's go to the CBA spreadsheet. Have a quick have a look at its its spreadsheet right. of all of the data. Big not the, picture. Not, not the chart, the spreadsheet. Oh, you want to okay. Yeah. Sorry. So you want to go down to I think a little technical detail. difficulty okay. with my co-host here. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that you wanted to go down so to So CBA Sorry. floated in the 90s. So if you want to bring so up the date, you'll be able to see. I think it's 91, isn't it? Yeah, 1991. Yeah. You can see there from 1991, you can see it's mainly white, isn't it? It's mm. positive returns. Um, there's a few negative years. There's a couple of negative years, 2002, while our market was falling into its low in 2003. Uh, then, you know, 2008 was down. So prior to the GFC, it was up 20% in 2007, 2008. I can't read that. 51. Here down 51, and the next year was up 89%. That's huge, isn't it? Then 2011, 12, Actually, it was let's down. just have a look again. So see, yeah. we compared BHP 2005. BHP obviously did better because we were looking at 50 plus percent. Yep. And then 2007, but we still had, there was a, still a good return for mm. CBA and then this stellar return, like you say, in 2009. So mm. it's all 
these stocks are going to move, you know, yeah. si- you know, have decent gains probably in the main years where the m- whole market's booming. Mm. So it doesn't really matter what you're investing in when that market boom happens. You've just got to be ready for it. You've got to you? be ready for it. So mm. let's scroll down a little bit further on the data, then we'll go into the chart because obviously what I was talking about before is obviously the banks changed between 2015 and 20 because of yeah. – a, the Royal Commission, I think that started in 2017, but all the mm. other stuff from the GFC, all of the issues that they had, all the class mm. actions and all sorts of other things that they were doing in the Royal Commission, they all divested their wealth divisions um, over this last decade. So they mm. changed personality. So yes. the question is, are they going to go back to what they were mm. or is it going to be a different type of beast we're going to see moving forward? Mm. Your question and my question to you, that was my question to you. You can answer that if you like. Look, I, mm-hmm. you, we always have to drill down with these things. So you mm-hmm. start from big picture and then come down. And if if the big picture suggests that we are in a boom, but it's just been masked by a lot of things going on globally and that mm-hmm. we are going to see the market continue to rise, it's really a question of how strong a rise we think that there could be. And mm-hmm. there's always going to be a year that is just knocks the lights out, you know, mm-hmm. At some point, I think pay, I think CBA is overdue. It, I think you're right. I th- I do too, but mm. I still think that it's not. People need to start thinking away from really long term at this point in the yeah. cycle. You know, they need to be more active and learn how to do that. Really important that you do, mm. and it could be that we see a, maybe two really good years um, on this stock. And then maybe another year that's good and there could be one year that's not so great. But I still think, and then after that, big question mark, don't ask me what's don't, coming don't after ask that. Me. I'd have to shoot you, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> all right. Like that. All right, so let's go to the chart and have a look at that. Okay. So we've got CBA. And this is what I was saying about is is looking at, you know, what that, um, what do you call it, that um, – I was going to say bar graph again, but it's not a bar graph. It's it's a column graph, yeah. sorry. And looking at well, what is the likelihood of CBA doing 20% plus or what is the likelihood of being doing 10% plus. Oh, the likelihood and of I doing do 20% that graph, is but high. Again, yeah, but again, yeah. you know, people need to comment um, on our YouTube channel what you want. And the more people that comment, the more likely we are to do it all. Well, we need to just go back. Mm. Like with BHP, similar sorts of scenarios we had here back in mm. 1999 through mm. all this period here to 2004, that's mm-hmm. five years roughly, sideways, there's yeah. no real um, really serious gains that happen. But after that, there's a really strong rise that happened obviously into the peak before the GFC. We saw that stellar rise after the GFC, but there was also really good gains that were made through this period here in 2013, 14, and that was before the Fed started yep. um, increasing um, rates and also mm-hmm. – at the point where the Royal Commission was coming in, the banks started to get shaky, you know, things were going on here. So it, you need to really look at things in the context of how many years sideways, how many years up, and what does the stock generally do? At the moment, obviously, we're we're sideways from 2000, 2021, really. Um, so that's two years sideways. So theory says that it could go more it could sideways. Go more. Mm. And you know, investors, long-term investors won't be concerned about that because they're just getting the dividends and CBA does pay well yep. and it's a fully frank dividend. It's just a question of a fall. That if the, if the fall that falls heavy. He, cool. Falls heavy, yeah. So we just have to wait and see at the moment. Um, it's been really struggling around that $100 mark, but it, it's a level where investors don't want to – if it goes below that level, the buyers seem to the come back come in back and they it chew again, it up yeah. again. Yep. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right, so let's move on to the next stock. Okay. Because I'm sure people listening to this will want to have lunch sometime soon or dinner because we go on for hours if we spend hours on every stuff. Yeah, my stock. stomach will start to growl. <laughs> <laughs> All so right. next one is what? CSL. CSL. And that one is 79%. Uh, we looked history. at that one. That's over history. Over 29 years, yeah. Yeah. And then we're seeing over the shorter term, we're looking at 90% as well. So CSL has been f- fairly consistent, obviously, from that. Mm. We're looking at it. But there will be periods with CSL even where it's gone sideways. It's the nature of mm. the overall f- patterns that form on the stock market. All right. So do you want to bring up its spreadsheet now of okay. all of his data? And we'll have a quick look at that and then we'll go into uh, the chart there. again. So all looking right. at that. So, yep. so you want the date on there, of course. Yeah, I know. you. Okay. So that's from 1994 to everybody. So you can see, look at all the white. 
Yeah. And there were a couple of, you know, couple of periods where it went down for two years, like two. And it's not just small amounts in white. You know, we're talking mm. big numbers through here prior to the GFC. Mm. So if the theory suggests that healthcare is strong and it and becomes a growth yeah. um, scenario for healthcare in times of boom where there's more money, yeah. then the theory is that CSL should grow, should grow. Quite, quite nicely. But it only takes, um, you know, a shock to cause a change in any shares share price. So that's something that you've just got to be mindful as well. Don't fall in love with CSL because Dale and Janine have said that this is one that's done well because we've seen here that the figures were still great here, but they got a bit patchy obviously through the GFC. But 2008, 2009, we didn't see that stellar boom um, for the for the yearly return with CSL, which is interesting, mm. like we did with the other shares. So you might have been thinking that because it was the best, one of the best shares on the market before that, that it should have the best performance when that kickback comes. Yep. But the data that you've got there is not showing that's the case. But it doesn't let you down. It you know after some time after that. The interesting period right did, now, if you look at this, sorry, yeah. I just you, you say prior to the last three years. There were tons of returns at 40, 50, mm. 60 percent, 20 percent, 20 plus, plus yeah. percent. And then we've seen since 2018, nothing. 40 percent, 31 percent, 49 percent. But nothing now. But the last three years, 20, 2020, 2021, and 2022, mm. 2020 was 3 percent rise, 2021 was 2 percent rise. And 2022 was zero. So it just looks like it's being held back, doesn't so it? So what's happened? Mm. And this is the thing is a lot of people go, oh, CSL, great stock, blah, blah, blah. But unless you look at some of this data, you don't see mm -hmm. what's going on. So is this overdue for a big run? Theory would suggest that's the case. However, you know, how many times have you seen the top of a market where it's gone sideways for, mm -hmm. say, I don't know, four or five years and then had the biggest fall? Well, that, that was my next comment is – Looking at all this data, we're talking about that last bit I was talking about is 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22. So mm. we've got six years that it hasn't had a negative return, mm -hmm. six years in a row. Going back over all of that 29 years, is there another period where it's done six years without falling? Mm. And I don't think there is. So is it overdue for a fall? I think it did. Like in the early days it did. Mm. Mm. Were six years of growth, constant growth? I thought I saw six years, but I... You know, you, wow. you can go back and have a look. Do you want me to go back and you have a look? You can go back and have a bit of a look, mm -hmm. see if there was a six-year period where it just can, was, it was rising for six years. Obviously, in, okay, so there is in the initial stages, 1994, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 2000. But then it had a 50% fall. Then 2001. it had two years of down. And then it had two years of down. So we had three, four, five, six, seven, eight years up. And then yeah. two years ago. So that's why, you know, we, we know that CSL's been sideways and it is a trading mm. stock right now. It is. Because of that. So long term investors might be happy though, because they're getting the dividend as well at the same time. Oh. However, we know that you've always got to be thinking about the potential for that risk. All right, let's yep. go to the chart. Okay. Okay, so you're bringing up the chart yep. of CSL. So this is the monthly chart. So that's you can see that big sideways move wait. over the last few years. No? You've jumped the gun. Oh, <gasps> sorry. But very similar, isn't it, in terms mm. of some other stocks that we're going to be looking at because it's just sideways at the top there and there's really a huge rise that's happened over time. So this is going to be interesting to see what it does over Well, look what happened here. Yeah. See, um, there's that period there, 2007 all the way through. It really didn't kick to a new all-time high until similar sort of thing to what we were looking on the at with the other stocks mm. except there, were, um, there was much more down moves on those other shares. Yeah. But still we're talking about four or five years of sideways action. Okay. So, and look, even back here in the very early days, 2000 and a pullback here into 2002. So two years there, not so much on this rise here, but now we've seen the same thing happen. As you said, we've got three years so far okay. of sideways action. So is it overdue now based on history? There could be another year in it, wow. but you know, well, it our students definitely off. know, and I'm sure our, some of our, our listeners and viewers will be able to work that out for I themselves. I mean, you've got to look at direction, as we say on the show, yeah. on an ongoing basis. So, I mean, if all of a sudden CSL took out some of these lows really mm. strongly, like October 2000 mm. and 20, 2022, 
you'd be really concerned about the mm. potential for that downside to happen. But if it turns around and takes off, then it mm. could just as easily go through the high. So that's the thing with sideways moves, isn't it? Yeah, You absolutely. can't prejudge what it's going to do, but you have to have a view of what it could look like if it went up mm. and a view of what it might look like if it fell. No, I agree. Mm. You know, listening, listening, there's a lot of strange noises going on outside of our studio. And it's not my it? stomach. And it's not your stomach. I'm thinking, <laughs> please don't think it's our stomachs going <laughs> off. Now, we, we do need to keep moving on a bit quicker. Yeah. So let's go quickly back to the spreadsheet, pick the next one up, and we'll keep going through the charts because I think they're getting the picture now. Yeah, I think so. So, All so, right, so... Did you want to do NAB? NAB or do you want to jump down through some of them? Well, we'll bring up all of the charts, but I just wanted to just show people we'll go straight from the stock to the chart nowadays because obviously we're showing them what we're talking about. Yeah, we don't need to go into the detail of the We don't need data. to go into the detail of the spreadsheet. Yeah. So NAB was 59% positive yeah. returns over its history. And then 50. And 50% in the last 10 years. So let's now go and show them the chart yeah. because people can do find this data for themselves too. Yeah, so that Our students tend to, can get this data easily. Tend to indicate that it's overdue for a bull run. Mm. Mm. So right now it's been more bearish. So March was more bearish. Yeah, but that's what we're talking about, isn't and it? And NAB's quite that. a volatile stock. There's the whole history of it. Mm. But, I mean, you can see down here that there was this move here, March 1986, just this terrible sort of move where it just hasn't really gone on, 87 crash, mm. and then we're coming through here. Big sideways move through the, the late 80s into the early 90s and we had the yeah. pyramid and one thing or another in the 90s. And then we're going through this period, 94, sideways again through to 96. And just a lot of choppiness up through yeah. to the high, the big correction, which was the GFC, which is in quite dramatic fashion actually for NAB. Yes. Because it was so, so strong on the downside, wasn't it, mm. with NAB? Very much so. And then just the terrible way that NAB unfolded after that, it was just not bullish at all. And it's it didn't way off like, its all-time high. We thought it was actually going to continue to fall mm. through the low, the, the, the low that was in 2009 at that time just because of how, mm. you know, terrible it looked. We thought it had the potential. Even if it did move up a bit, we thought it could go lower, okay, which so it what's, did what's the, eventually what's the through COVID. What's likely to hold for NAB? Well, I think it's changed personality. This rise that we've seen recently is like indicating a precursor to a further bull run. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll see a bit more consolidation on NAB. The risk is at the moment as to whether it's going to take out this low here. I'm hoping that that's not the case because... Yep. If it does, it could be indication that we're going to see that sort of thing across the, the whole okay. set big four. But at the moment, um, it's down. So you wouldn't be trying to pick it up or buy it because it's nothing. But it'd be on your watch falling. list to pick it up, possibly. It'd be on your list to wait till it goes again. You might mm. even get a really nice trend line down there mm. on the monthly chart eventually when it starts to move up or even on the weekly. Mm. All right. So mm. let's move on to the next stock on our spreadsheet okay. in the top 10 yes. stocks. As I said, because I think people are getting the idea of what we're talking about. So if, they, if you're one of our students or graduates, you can get this data that's on the spreadsheet. You can do the spreadsheet yourself just by exporting the data. If you don't, yep. are not one of our students, it's, you could probably get the data from different places okay. and create this spreadsheet yourself. Yep. So Westpac's the next one. So we've got 6450, mm -hmm. a similar scenario. Similar scenario. So let's just quickly go to the chart. Than in the last in its history. Yeah. And we see if we look at the monthly chart of Westpac, we can bring that up and we can see the same sort of thing. But, it, you know, it had a period where it actually performed a bit better than NAB. However, more recently, it's been a laggard um, in terms of its performance. Well, compared prior to the GFC, this stock was uh, a real darling, isn't yeah. it? Was the market, and but since then, but look at that beautiful trend yeah. from '92 all the way up here. I mean, yeah. that's just sensational. It's beautiful. So there's because it's done that before. It, the rules are that it could repeat could do, that again, yeah, and we're just yeah. waiting. Well, that was mm. the question I was asking earlier, but. If anybody who's just has a love affair with banks and mm. just says, I have that banks in my portfolio, if what we're showing them now doesn't prove to them that they shouldn't have had a love affair with banks over the last decade, then something's wrong. The last decade, okay, yeah, yeah. definitely. Because if you're looking at, here's 2000 and let's say um, six yep. there. So coming forward from 2006 through to, uh, let's say, 20, 2016, mm. there was a gain in there. So you still had a rise in there, but it wasn't great. You've just gone through dividends, that. but CPI was eating all that up. Yeah, well, that's true, isn't it? Um, but as you move the dial forward, then you yeah. all of a sudden you are becoming your line ball. Yeah. Um, and then you may even be negative depending on where you actually bought in because the stock's now trading at 21.37. 
Okay, so what do you think of Westpac for the for the foreseeable future? Right. Well, look, is there hope? I think there's a lot of hope, and to me, that that's a the way that it's unfolded is actually a bullish formation that should, if the stock starts to kick up through twenty three dollars, see it go higher. Mm -hmm. However, if Westpac pulls below this low here in October yeah, to twenty twenty two, then we're going to see this almost downward push on the stock. I don't think it'll be diabolical, but mm -hmm. I just think that um, that's a real short-term risk. I'm short -term excited risk. because but, this, oh, stock, yeah. this stock is tra currently trading around half of what it was at its all-time high I know. in April it's 2015. I mean, like look, at that. 50 look at this level across here. It's just sensational, Huge. that level we've got there. And I'm, I get excited when I see that. And I mean, people go, oh, yeah, the bank's good growth stocks. Well, mm. if you'd had a bank and you bought it in April 2015, we're eight years down mm. the track, and right now the price is half of what it was at that particular yeah. time. So that's not necessarily a great investment. But, but it, right it doesn't, now, mean, it it doesn't mean to buy it now, but it means mm. to just watch and wait till mm. the market's starting to suggest that it's going up again. Correct. So that takes your risk. It's, it's all about your risk. If you want to take on extra risk and the mm. big bunny's not taking on that risk, well, then that's really your choice. But you can get in at a time where the market's actually made it lower risk mm. for you. Mm. So, all right, shall we move on? Move, keep moving on. Keep moving on. So we bring up the spreadsheet. So that was okay. Westpac. So we're now ANZ, a same story. It's a, almost a duplicate, 64% and 50% at the bottom there. Yep. You can see. So if we go through to the graph here or the chart, we can see ANZ. If we come right back no, to the start. Westfield. There we go, ANZ, yeah. And then we've got the same sideways move. It looks, looks very similar very to NAB, similar, doesn't, doesn't it? it? And, yeah, similar to so Westpac, NAB and ANZ, um, really not great over recent years. And ANZ's actually taken out that short-term low there. So it could be the end of the move down, but it could just fluff around here for a short time period of time. We've got some other troughs across here as well, which are, it's nice to see that it's holding there. But History suggests that obviously they're both looking very similar right now, but mm. ANZ and Westpac, but history would suggest looking at that data that Westpac is likely to perform better than ANZ based on that history. Of yeah. That, of, but let's just mm. have a look at ANZ's um, but again, they're chart long term. in the last 10 years. They are, but let's just go back and see because it had I a beautiful- I can coin and get that one, right? See, to me, this looked at- as lovely as Westpac, that beautiful rise up there. So if ANZ fits, you know, the historical uh, form that we've seen more recently, it could take off. We've got slight differences in the overall patterns in terms of the way the stocks have unfolded. Yeah. I mean, when I'm looking at the big picture analysis of some of these banks, there's also the thought of the, you know how they put Armageddon in the, in the news? Oh, yeah. There are patterns here that are telling me Armageddon as well, yeah. but I'm not saying for now, but down the track. Down so the that's track. what we've got to be mindful of that and to be more active and watching what's going on because we don't want to be in there for these big 55% falls that happen. Yeah, I think the time for buy and hold is way past. I don't think investors, and, and with the, regardless of whether you feel whether you're an investor or a trader. Yeah, that was like a golden period, wasn't it? That it was a golden trending. period in the 80s, 90s. And we will you know, get right it again. Into, yeah. We will get it again, but maybe we'll tell but you when we think that will be on the next, on one, on one of the you um, can't podcasts be, You can't be do. complacent on the stock market anymore. Mm. You have to be an active investor and therefore if you don't know how to do that, I would suggest people get my first book, How to mm -hmm. Beat Their Managed Funds by 20%. It's still free. You yep. just pay the shipping. You go to our website, homepage, there's a button there, click on it and we'll send it out to you. But even my second book, Accelerate Your Wealth, is it's all perfect mm. for helping people be a bit more active. You don't have to be Einstein or rocket scientist. You know, sometimes I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed on Well, just to day. be able to join in, I think, yeah. to be able to join in with you and go through exercises and look at charts in more detail than what we're talking about here but not necessarily at the diploma level, which the Trading Mentor offers. It's perfect well, for true, people – who are investors wanting to look at, you know, these sorts of things. Well, I went through in, well, no, that on, this, on in a great Monday of this week, I did a whole recording for 35, 40 minutes on Bank of Queensland going mm. over 20 years, showing people how it's unfolding, how I was thinking, mm. what you could be thinking, what you should be looking for, what you should be watching. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, for Trading Mentor, for the 11 lessons plus that recording or a recording like that every two weeks, for under two grand, I mean, that's a no-brainer mm. in my book. It's like it's got to be worth it. 
because you're going to make your money on one trade. That's, well, you know, so many so, people have. But I think, you know, people, if you do want to get on the Trading Mentor course, go to our website, wealthwithin.com.au, mm. click on the education tab and you'll see our courses and Trading Mentor is there. Just want to chat to our team, do so. So we've just talked a bit about ANZ. We've finished with now that Now we've one. got Macquarie, which no, is one is of the exciting. big ones, wasn't it? So that was over 27 years at 78%, 78% positive and then returns. 90%. And 90% yeah. in the last 10 years. That's right. So let's just go and have a look now. And it melted down with the GFC. It did big time. Mm. And it's still, you know, pulled up. But, I mean, there's some interesting patterns on Macquarie that get us thinking, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they do, don't they? <laughs> Oh gosh! I get excited when I see this stock at the moment. I mean, it, it's you know, it, it's possibly got more downside, but I think it's, it would strongly be my watch list. Given it's how funny it because sometimes you can get when you get these sideways moves, you can get mm-hmm. false um, triggers. So sometimes a stock like this could pull back as hard as it's done, and then rip around and go back up the other way mm-hmm. some months later. So is that more of a sign of the times that we need to get used to? Um, I think it's just this part of the cycle that we're in at the moment. It's like that because if yeah, you look at what happened prior to the GFC, we saw, yep. you know, a big it had a big run up. We had a big sell off. Then we had this period of consolidation that happened yep. over what was about a year, yep. and then it took off again to the high. So, you know, there was this sideways move that happened here. It took off to the high, and then a big pullback. Um, and then a big meltdown you know, we've March had, 2009. Yeah, we've, we've had this um, rise here. We've had a pullback and, you know, it's a question now, um, are we going to see the next rise now? Um, well, it's well over. It was well over $200. Mm. It was miles and miles above its all-time high from prior to the GFC. Mm-hmm. So it's done really, really, really well. Is it? That's my question is, is it going to be really pulling back over the next few months. Well, to we don't know year. if this is one of those false triggers or not yet, yeah. and that's the thing. So if if Macquarie pulled back strongly below this um, January 2023 low, I'd be really concerned about I it. I would be too. Mm. So it's something to watch. All right, so let's move on to the next one, unless you've got more to say on Macquarie. No, that's good. That's fine. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So we've got a couple more to go. So, okay, that, so, so we've FMG, got FMG, Woodside and West Farmers to go. Over the whole history, that was 21 years. So Fortescue, 67% over 21 yep. years. It's positive. Yeah, and now we're looking at 60%. So, so it just shows the volatility of what's mm. been going on with the, that sector. Can so, we, can, before we go to the yeah. chart, can you go and bring up the actual spreadsheet of the data? Because this I was one thinking is so the same interesting. Thing. I was just going to do that. Yeah, so the FMG, let's have a look down there. So we need to look at the dates. Okay, that's so, the point that you want to talk about at the start well, it as is, well. It was obviously 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. It was zero growth. It was a spec It was stock, one cent, it, <laughs> two cents high, one cent low and closing at one cent. So it was a speculative stock. Mm. For five years it was nothing. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, holy moly, in 2003, 700% growth. And people go, wow. Well, it went from one cent to seven, eight cents. Mm. So, and that was a speculative stock. And then people got interested in that stock. And then we had growth from 2004 to 2007 in the GFC. So we went from mm. 700%, 238%, mm-hmm. 104%, yeah. 146 and then 464% just before the GFC. And interesting, the, the biggest picture. growth just before the GFC. And then it fell. A 75% fall. Yeah. To so now let's look at a bit more recent times. Okay. And so then we a go through, we can see a lot of volatility in there and and quite a few big negative numbers in here. So in the GFC, we had that 75% fall, you can see in 2008, but then it mm. was one of those great stocks that it rebounded was. strongly in 2009. So if you're thinking about this one, 2005, remember we looked at the other stocks, yep. bullish, 2007, super bullish. Big decline, so more of an exaggeration in the big corrections. Yeah. So you've got to be mindful of that with these types of shares. And then after the correction, you can get a stellar rise that happens. But then, you know, you're going to see some big corrections in in volatility from this year, 50 odd, well, 30 it's more odd. more volatile and more negative years mm. in since the GFC than I had beforehand. Yes. The last two years, we've seen 6% and 2%. So 2022, uh, 21 and 22 um, we've had low, I think there's a mistake on my data there. Um, down the bottom there, I've got 6% for 2022, but then I've got 2023. I'm not sure why that is there. Um, but Well, 2023 would just be whatever the current data would is, be would the, it? Whatever the current data is, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm not sure whether it's, I need to check that again. But Well, it's not you know, finished this year. But so we've I been a lot more volatile in the last sort of 
decade, yeah, this one, right. right, that showed in the thing. So now we can go to the chart and give it our opinion on what we think it's uh, going to do over the you know, the coming year or okay. two. Okay. So FMG. So let's go to FMG on the chart. So we're looking at that. But look, even look at that huge, big sideways yeah, so so, so like high. like CSL, but more volatile. Mm. So CSL's had that big sideways move at the top. Yep. Same sort of thing. We've seen it on Commonwealth Bank. Yep. But we, if we're going to see a market wide uh, movement in that direction, then this one's going to experience it in much more of a dramatic way. A bigger move. Okay. So bigger yep. downward. Bigger move, downward saying. moves when it moves down. Yep. But I think you know, look at. This is sort of like out of character, really. I mean, look at how many years. It went up on a really nice little angle here, a nice angle out of the GFC there. That was 2016 and 2009 from those lows. Really yep. nice runs up. Shows the nature of it, nice trading stock. Before the GFC, it you know, it was just phenomenal, phenomenal. what it did. And people fell in love with it. And that's what mm. I was almost trying to allude to is because it did all of that in the past, yeah, it's going to have some good runs in the future, but now – this is a big stock. It's in the top yeah. 20. It's on the radar of every single managed fund, all big institutions. Mm. So was, when it sort of first floated, it was that speculative area. So now it's more mature. It's not going to do all the same things that it did. And in it's the in days. the top part of the market. So yeah. therefore it's they got have more to put liquidity, their money in. More, more transparency again mm. because it's under the spotlight all the time. So don't so expect look, it to be. I'm, you know, still bullish on the iron ore miners at yeah. the moment until they tell me otherwise, and mm. this that's what I would think. I'd cool. still like to see them pull back a little bit more at the moment, though. All right. So let's look at the next one. So we've got All two right. more to go, haven't we? We do, and let's go back down to the list. There we go. We go back to the start, to the top, to the summary. So we've got we got Woodside can see that and we've got West Woodside Farmers. there, 59% over 39 years. Yeah. Now, that's a lot of data. That's a and lot of data. And then we've got – if we come down here, we've got 50%. So therefore, it's showing that it's not – necessarily a great stock to be in given mm. that the last 10 years was 50% and over the last, what, 40 years it's been 60. So it's showying me that's a 59. trading stock. It's Definitely. It's not a buy and hold stock. Yeah. So if you are thinking that Woodside is a buy and hold even because it's a top stock, you'd be sadly incorrect in that. You need to be more active when you're looking at Woodside. Yeah, so if we're looking at we'll Woodside look at, at the moment, we can see again, like the rest of the market, it's in that sideways move. And it hasn't been able to break out of it. So the risk is that it falls away. But, you know, more recently, this last week, it's mm. showing that it's holding on, even yep. though it got sold off quite strongly. It almost indicated like it, the bottom was about to drop out of it. And with this stock, you can't mm. be shy about getting out of it. You have to get out if it's going to start doing yeah. that because this is what it's done here in 2014. And this is what it did with after the that big rise in 2009. It fell really strongly. And again, we've seen some big falls in here through 2018 and then, of course, with COVID. So I don't feel that this is the same time as those periods for this stock. It looks different. However, until it gets back above sort of around $38, $37, we, mm. we could just assume that it could either keep going sideways or it could fall. It is. And to me, you know, if if looking at this chart that you've got on your screen and the, the People listening to the audio don't see this, but their all-time high of Woodside is the GFC high, mm. and current and it's been falling ever since. It fell all the way down into the COVID low in March 2020, roughly, or that area. But yep. right now, it's still sitting around half of its all-time high price. Look, and it's been so struggling. Not even, a good investment. No, and even when they started no. offering higher dividends, which I think was somewhere through here, I remember, mm. to try to keep the share price up. Eventually, it might have actually been here. Mm to try to prop up the share price and it started to change shape, look different, but then eventually fell away oh, anyway right. with the rest of the, the mining So it's looking um, good at the moment. Sector. Mm. Um, you're thinking it's got some upside potential? Look, there's this stock long term looks like there is really some, definitely some upside potential because there's plenty of space well, between here and the old time You'd want to get more excited about it, wouldn't you? 13 yeah. years of downward move, you're thinking That's right. well, it should be overdue for However, I wouldn't rush into anything. Okay. I just stay out of it or, or you know, if you're trading it short term, you still have to wait for it to move, make that move that I was talking about. Okay, let's get stuck into the last one. We've got oh, West good. Farmers, haven't we? Don't forget about West the Farmers last is one. A great I know stock West to Farmers look is at. one of your favourite stocks. So West Farmers, thirty eight years, seventy one percent. Seventy one percent. That's a nice number over that amount of time mm. to see seventy percent wins over forty years. It's gotta be good. And over the last ten years, Janine, drum yep. roll. 
drum roll, 80%. So it's proving that it's actually improved. Mm. But does that mean, therefore, it might be one of the laggards it could going be. forward? And That's it could be question. one of the ones that we need to exit and mm. put this money in something else. So it could, because it's been producing so well over the last decade. So but what are we in doing? saying that, in yeah. the recent volatility, look how it's held up. It's beautiful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, and to me, this is if you're more of a longer term buy and holder, this is the stock you'd actually go for, mm. you know. And even if you're a trader, it's still good stock, you know, to me. But it does have long periods of sideways movements as well. Yeah, exactly. So if we just um, grab this little annoying bar that's at the top <laughs> there, <laughs> I can say that. I'm not going to be shy about it. Uh, we can see that, again, it's still a stock that trades sideways. Mm. So 94, we've got so sideways moves in there to 96, as we talked about before, yeah. more sideways, but very choppiness in here, more of a trading stock through People here to 2000. People periods, aren't they? They do. And then look before the GFC. Yeah, this is really unusual because a lot of stocks mm. were making significant mm. gains and continuing to rise, whereas West Farmers went through some mm, interesting times then, didn't it? Mm. Um, and then peaked in 2007. But early in 2007... Yep. And then fell away strongly, but recovered really quickly. More sideways actions after the GFC, after that really strong recovery. Yep. But then this period really got us. It did, didn't right? It? From two, it was 2013, so which was around the time that the mm. Fed was yep. um, talking about changing their policy, and then through here to 2000 and all the way here, except for when they announced that they were going to offload coals. Yes. Then it changed. So that was what. Five years five of years. sideways movement. So, right, that's it really potential, a- <laughs> but it was just so frustrating. And then it took off like a rocket and it went yeah. from, you know, $32 up to $66. And then COVID <laughs> brought it to an abrupt end and brought it all the way back down to and where it, it wanted to be. And then it took off again. That's right. And then it took off. So, so right now, what are you thinking? Well, look, I mean, Down there's always up. there's always a risk that this could be a distribution as part of a, an overall move down, right? But could be. at the moment, I think at least in the short to medium term, it's up. Mm-hmm. Um, and if the whole market is going to be bullish for the next few years, this has to go with it. It has to so, go with it, doesn't it? So I like it. Mm, it should be on your watch list. Anything else you'd like to say? No, I think I'm pretty happy with that actually. No, the thing is because obviously we've just now covered the top 10 stocks on the All Ordinaries Index by market capitalization. If they're somebody who's a student of our diploma course or graduate can get the data that we've mm. got, put it into a spreadsheet. Um, and do exactly the same spreadsheet that I've done. You mm-hmm. don't need to be a rocket scientist because if I can do yeah. that and I'm not brilliant on spreadsheets, anybody no, you can better do check that. It. <laughs> so we'll try and figure out how to do those, those um, what do you call them, column graphs yes. um, for that anyway. But um, So hopefully everybody's learned a little bit about how we start to we, – we just don't take the chart. We just don't take P, mm. e, EPS. We use a lot of different things to help us understand the market and the psychology of the stocks and the market that we're actually trading. We don't just take everything for granted. We always go test everything, mm-hmm. trust nothing um, yes. for that as well. So I'm I'd, learning things all the time. Like yeah. just some of the things that I've been learning lately, it's just blowing my mind about the market. And, you know, they're just what the charts tell you is just fantastic. Well, you know, the most successful people, and I was chatting to somebody the other day, and the most successful people mm. are the ones that are continually learning all the time. If mm-hmm. you stop learning, then you're going to implode, not explode. Yeah. And, you know, to me, if you want to be more successful in your life, whether that's business, whether mm. that's personally health, whatever, whether it's in money, you yep. still need to be learning and need to be growing and that's really why we get so much success with how our many, How many courses. books do you reckon that you've read over the years? Oh, hundreds. Oh, I know. You know and somebody you're still asked reading me that more yesterday. through Talking Wealth, all these people mm. that we're getting to speak through. I know. To I'm reading their books. And all these amazing books. Yeah, I, I was mm. chatting to a guy yesterday who runs sort of a, he calls it an unnetworking group. And I went, what? And I was just <laughs> piqued by interest. So I said, call me. You know, and they have events where they have people who have an abundance mindset yep. and business people, and do it in Melbourne. Um, so more business and entrepreneurs, mm. but people have that abundance mindset or the mindset of giving back yeah. and helping and mentoring people, which both of you, mm. both of us do all the time. And he go, he said to me, sounds like you read a lot of books. And I said, mate, I can have anything between <laughs> two and ten of them to go at any one time because something might resonate to me about a book Mm. that I might read a chapter or two because I need it right now, but then I'll put that book down That's and grab your another intuition one. Because telling it, you, isn't it's it? my intuition saying, oh, you need to read that book These again. These have got all your tools. And people say to me, how do you up. read 10 books at the same time and you're reading mm. a chapter here and a chapter there? And I go, well, it's because I just get the bit I need 
and that fills my soul, if that makes sense. Mm. And then I move on to the next one. So makes sense. I've got lots of books I'm reading at the moment. So people um, always be learning and learning from the wisdom of others. And uh, to me, you know, get on, you know, you, you're listening to these Talking Well podcasts because well, hopefully we're educating and helping people. But check out our Wealth Within TV um, on YouTube. So if you want to see the charts and everything that Jenny and I are talking about, the spreadsheets, so get on to the Wealth Within TV. Now, if you do want us to do the other 10 stocks, you will need to put a comment on the YouTube channel and say, hey, I'd love to see the other 10 stocks. Please do that. But you also need to hit the like button and you need to subscribe to the channel because that's your payment for, for us uh, doing this for you as well. And we would love to, you to share our videos on your social channels. The more you do that, the more things that Janine and I will actually do and help you with the job you understand. So if you can do that, if you're listening mm -hmm. to us on a podcast, make sure you give us a five-star rating on iTunes and whatever other platform you are. Um, I think we've had a great podcast today. What do you reckon? We've had a fantastic podcast, but you know, it won't feed me. I'm it won't feed you. I better now. go and take you out for lunch. She's just worked hard for it. Anyway, you've been listening to Talking Wealth. You've been here with uh, Janine Cox, a senior analyst at Wealth Within. And I'm Dale Gillen, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within. Goodbye, good luck and good trading. <laughs>